one. Happy New Year, everyone out there, and welcome to the first episode in 2023 of 30 Minutes with a Modern Mystic. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much, and Happy New Year to you and to everybody who looks and listens to our wise and wonderful words. Having started with saying Happy New Year, today we want to talk about sadness, how to deal with sadness, sadness on the spiritual path. And um, maybe I open up. I think what I would like to start with is maybe not the obvious sadness that maybe you feel when your pet dies or some relative has an issue, but more that phenomenon which I have encountered over the years that every once in a while there seems to be a sadness coming out of nowhere that just um, moves through you. And then if you don't give it too much attention after a day or two, it's gone. But it can be very intense, right? And so I think that's maybe an interesting point to start unless you want to start somewhere else. No, I think that's an interesting place because uh, it's it's not, um, I mean, really most sadness, like a cat dies and you feel sad and it's natural enough. But the sadness lasts in generally in proportion to the emotional attachment you had to the cat. And I'm not in any way inferring you shouldn't have an emotional attachment. I've got a cat named Lucky who is 16 years old and I definitely have a very nice bond with him and I would feel sad when he's gone. So that's pretty generalized sadness and uh, generally time deals with that. But that sadness you're talking about, I think personally that there is a sadness within the human consciousness. I don't mean that it should be there and it's a natural thing, but I think that there is a sadness because in the human consciousness, there is a deeper knowing that we're a shadow of what we could be or maybe should be. And that we, that it's okay, we've still got time, we're on the path and on the journey. But I do remember very well when I was in America, um, and this was shortly after, I'm going to sneeze, so hang on a minute. Sorry, folks, I'm still in the final stages of flu. So my it's, voice is a bit husky. It's proof. Still, it's life. I'm still doing a bit of sneezing. It's a 36-hour flu, but then you get the little hanging on parts. So um, I was in America once giving us, it was not many years, only about a year or two after I'd become spiritually enlightened. And I was with a group of people and I was the running a seminar. And probably the oldest man in there, his name was Gus. I think he was in his 80s. And he used to write, not a blog, obviously, because blogs hadn't been invented, but he'd write articles in his own newsletter that he put out, which went quite widely. And he told me that he thought that I had the saddest eyes he'd ever seen in anybody. And that sort of hit me quite hard. And as I reflected on it, I realized that as I, when I became spiritually enlightened, I could feel the sadness of humanity. You could say I could feel the sadness of the world. And I tried to dismiss it, but it was there. And uh, I didn't know how to deal with that. Nobody ever told me such a thing was possible. All the books I'd written on spirituality, none of them had ever said, oh, by the way, this might come if you when you're spiritual and I am nothing. And so I found the only way I could deal with it, and his remark precipitated it because I was aware of this very profound sadness and the sadness of humanity that I felt made me feel sad. And so I sort of suspect that it, that in those subconscious or <coughs> deeper conscious moments, like you mentioned, 
a person feels it every now and again, especially if they're on their spiritual path. And so I then um, went into deep meditation, and I used to meditate for hours on end in those days. And somewhere about three hours into it, <coughs> I was moving nicely away. And I found this, like, what I would say, I like a cloud that hung over the human field of energy, over the human consciousness. It clung to it. It wasn't a cloud, but it's the closest I can get to that. <coughs> and, uh, and I kept going above that, and I found joy. Now, it wasn't as though the whole humanity was joyful, but there was enough of humanity that had real joy, and I don't mean happiness, I mean real joy that comes from the soul. And I noticed how incredibly powerful it was. You could almost pick out the different notes of every soul. <coughs> and so I decided that I would focus on that joy because I couldn't eliminate the sadness, but I'd focus on the joy. And I did that, and I continued to do that. So gradually, I was less and less, um, I'm more and more disassociated from the sadness and um, connected with the joy. And uh, But I still find that if I just allow myself, I can soon very quickly move into that place <coughs> where I feel that sadness that's in humanity. Hmm. Interesting. And I feel that one of the reasons of that is, I guess I said at the beginning, because we know on a soul level that we're not reaching our potential, that we're being sidetracked into success and money and revenge and rage and all the things that we've got, all the negative emotions that we have created. I'm not saying any of this is bad or wrong, but we are creators and we create the whole range of human emotions, which is very considerable. And I somehow think we've become so lost in all that area that, the, that there's a collective deeper knowing that we, that we haven't lost our potential, we haven't reached it. We somehow got by, we took a wrong track somewhere and the potential lays somewhere ahead of us still. It doesn't lay ahead because there is no ahead, but that's nevertheless the feeling. And I think that creates some of the sadness. Also, when I have these moments, it seems like there is some kind of hopelessness or apathy that comes along with it. Right. Well, so apathy. They hold hands, Thomas, I think. Thomas Merton, the renegade um, Catholic priest, he said if there is one sin, it is apathy. And I am inclined to agree with that. I don't believe in sin at all. But apathy, well, what difference do I make? I can't do anything. Right. The world's in a mess. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm just a little me. That is sort of so typical of apathy. And today, I think apathy is having a field day um, among modern hum humanity, having a field day, because so many feel disempowered. And when you sort of realize that, uh, you know, third, when I was 35, I began my path consciously towards self-empowerment and everything that goes with spirituality. And... Uh, <clears throat> And I realized among all my peer group how rare I was that I gave up everything, income and everything. That was my focus. And I didn't want anything to try to supersede it. And it's a very scary and maybe foolish way to live. But I sort of found I had no, no choice. But uh, the... the uh, the, the things you connect with is beyond what, a, what you would normally think about. I had a long conversation with my brother yesterday evening. Um, he's a very, very brilliant man, intellectually very brilliant. 
but everything he thinks about is very much what I'd call the small picture of life. Even though he's very much into ancestors, it's still a small picture of life. And I find that human thinking is all basically the small picture of life rather than the vast picture of life. Like <clears throat> if I mentioned to him that 20 to 50 million years ago, we were far in advance to what we are now, he would have a real problem with that because we weren't here then, according to his world. And so I think just thinking in those terms of that smaller world, I think that in itself produces a, a, um, a connective um, sadness in humanity that, that we couldn't even pinpoint why, because we see out of the vast picture, we see just a tiny, it's like we look at the world through a keyhole and through the keyhole, we can see a little section of it and that is all there is. And that I think creates its own collective sadness that we don't take our eye away from the keyhole and look at the bigger picture. I'm wondering if sadness is our soul's natural reaction to those moments of disconnection when we grow apart further and further. Uh, you know, there's when there's no question, there's no question about that, and also. You know, when you look at it, we're in a world of duality, right? Because that's the way we learn. And uh, <clears throat> when you transcend duality, you transcend this, some of these problems. But uh, <clears throat> therefore, you know, we have a humanity that is seeking to be happy. We have hundreds of songs: "Be happy, everything be happy." But the duality to happy is sad. And so, in creating putting so much energy into creating happiness, we're also creating the duality of it, which is sadness. And it's sad that we don't know. <laughs> Now, you mentioned humanity. <coughs> In your experience, from your perspective, is sadness a human thing? Or is sadness something, a universal expression of souls that just... I think it's a universal, universal expression of soul, but I think it's still developing um, in humanity more, shall we say, you know, <clears throat> animals are souls, but like herd animals are group souls, and as are bird flocks and fish shoals. And as you get to the individualization in animals, they become families, like a pride of lions and begin to take on far more distinctive personalities And <clears throat> excuse me. In that stage, the soul is still developing, and it's still developing in us, and it has a long way to go. But this is why I think we feel sadness more acutely. Like um, when I was a farmer, if you took the calf away from the cow, some cows would bellow for an hour, and that's it, done. Um, What, what did you do? What did you upset me? How did it happen? Well, another uh, cow would um, bellow for two or three days and, um, and then eventually it would let go. And so, you know, there was a sense of loss and there was certainly in their bellowing for the calf, there was a sense of sadness, I felt. I felt it quite strongly. Would you... And I I began to farm in a way that I wouldn't have that happen, but that's different. Now that so, but in us, like I know men who lost their wives 20 years ago and they're still sad. They right, function. They function, but they're not. And I find that sad. I, well, so from what I can observe in humanity and also in my own life, uh, <coughs> the moments that humans tend to move into sadness the most are the moments when we experience some kind of loss right and then if we don't manage to transcend or transform that somehow we that sticks with us but would you would you therefore say that sadness like in the beginning you mentioned attachments emotional attachments um that there's a strong connection between sadness and emotional attachments right would you still so would you say that sadness 
even though you might be detached, is still a natural reaction, but just you move through it quicker? Yes, I think if you don't have that emotional attachment, it's not a matter of being detached, um, because that sort of says you have no feeling involved. Right. But if you are not emotionally attached, but enjoying it and fond of it, and even loving, because love is not an attachment, then the sense of loss moves through. Um, it takes a time. It still takes a time because most people have to pra um, have to um, resolve it. And uh, and what's the word they use um, nowadays? Um, a common word. Um, they want closure. And uh, I don't quite get that because closure, again, is a small picture saying, well, now I've got the bones of my kid who was murdered uh, 20 years ago. Now I can have closure. Well, I don't quite get how having those bones gives them closure. But on some emotional level, <clears throat> they definitely feel that the child is now, they have the bones, even if there's only a few, and they can lay it to rest. And so in them, there's a process of finishing, of bringing something to a closure. In other words, the cycle of their life hadn't finished for them, even though it was finished for the soul that left the body or was murdered, it's not finished for the other person. And <clears throat> until then, they're sad. They get closure. And I'm not saying the sadness is all gone, but to a point for them, at a certain level, it's resolved. And this is understandable if you live in the illusion. I mean, it's very understandable in the illusion. But I think the greatest sadness is caused by the collective consciousness, which is aware of the illusion and sees how consciousness is trapped in, by the, in the beings that live in the illusion. Now, here's a provocative question or thought if we look at this deeper sadness in humanity and we take a step back and at some point we reach god or we reach supreme creation we reach the source of everything and trying to understand where sadness came into play and if we take into account maybe i think you use the word oversold sometimes other people use other words but let's just say we have different cascades of beings in between God and us that incorporate different whatever celestial forms of existence whatever it is then would it be far-fetched to assume that such a and I think some people use the word logos right so that such a such an entity as logos that could be our galaxy for example uh could have the seed of sadness in it and therefore the whole part of that oversoul the whole part of that logos or however you call it is going through that collective experience of sadness until it's mutually dissolved and until it's one onion layer higher i can't give an answer to that categoric but i suspect yeah. that such a thing is possible but i would also Feel that the probability is low because the creation is love and in love there is no sadness sadness is not the opposite of love it's the absence of love and when there's sufficient love then sadness is gone this is why when you get men who don't love themselves um, but their wife does they can thrive on the love from their wife and suddenly she's gone and they have no love for themselves. So there's not just an absence of this woman <coughs> in their life. Suddenly, there's an absence of love in their life. <coughs> and that creates an enormous sense of loss and sadness as well. Not that I expect them to understand what's going on. But uh, I, a lot of people tell me, that to do Earth um, work with work with the planet Earth and work with waking mountains up, of which I have a certain tiny degree of skepticism, because I know they went to wake up a mountain, Mount McGrath, many years ago, and I'd been there 
helping her. And as far as I was concerned, he couldn't be more awake if he wanted. Um, but, you know, we have different definitions. And uh, <clears throat> they feel the sadness in some trees. They feel sadness in a mountain. I have tried hard as I can to find a tree with sadness in it and have never managed it yet. I've never found a sad mountain. I don't find sadness in our earth because our time on earth, according to, let's just say the earth is a vast state of elemental consciousness within, and intelligence, but vast, but very elemental. You know, like, does water feel sadness? No, but can it carry it? Yes. And so we are water beings, basically, water bodies. And so our bodies can carry the energy of sadness in the water, but the water itself doesn't experience sadness. And it brings you almost to the question, then do the souls we are feel sadness, or is it the emotional content totally that is filled with sadness? Because I've had a few dreams where I've died, and I've gone um, to a place where there's people I've known for lifetimes, and I don't find a speck of sadness in that, not the faintest bit of sadness. And yet there are many, many layers of that. And I'm sure down on the lower layers of that 49 layers, there would be sadness. So I think sadness is probably in direct proportion to the lack of being conscious and being loved and being conscious of being love and expressing love. I think sadness is directly proportional to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, the reason I was asking is because if I go into a meditative, <coughs> if I go into a meditative state, or even if I go into remote nature, then I can, I can reach a place where I'm not connected with that sadness uh, more easily. And in meditation, it feels like it's very far away out of the normal human field. Um, but then when I'm in a city environment or when I'm around a lot of people or um, depending on, on the area, um, it's denser, right? So that that was the reason I was bringing that up. And then the, the thing that you just said, um, I think maybe it would be fair to say that in the end, sadness is just one of the many ways that out of free will we have chosen to learn unconditional love through. Yeah. Um, it's another one, uh, I realize, another aspect of this. All nature lives in the moment and is conscious in the moment. And the moment does not hold sadness. Right. So if we carry sadness, we take it into the moment, but it's not in the moment and therefore enters us. But because when it, the, the, moment, the moment is clean. I, I agree when it comes to the, the sadness about loss or <laughs> all of these things. But when it's this other type of sadness that sometimes just overcomes me, for example, out of nowhere, and there's no nothing connected with it, like there's no event. Oh, there no, is. There is a connection. No, but, but not, what I'm aware. no, no. What I'm you're saying is there is aware. no. No, what I'm saying there is no event uh, in that moment, or there is no reason. <laughs> I, there is no reason to come up. There is no reason yeah. I could come up with or anything. So that sadness um, seems to be. It kind of seems to be in the moment. I mean, it doesn't. It's not related, at least the way that I perceive it. It's not related to anything in the past or the future or any. Uh, said about anything particular if, if that makes sense well it does make sense but i don't necessarily agree with it that, that's just I, the perception i mean i'm just saying that's yeah, the perception sure no i understand what you're saying and i don't disagree with that what i'm saying is i found that uh when i used to be sad i don't feel it anymore there was always a <clears throat> a link that if i took the link I would find a connection that went back maybe even a thousand years into a life where there was something unresolved and I died horribly. And um, that energy in the moment of death 
was never quite dealt with. And so it just comes along, it journeys along, and uh, and you're sitting quietly, you're in a deep meditative state, um, because in that moment you're entering timelessness. You're no longer so much in linear time. You're not thinking, okay, in 10 minutes I'll go and have a coffee. You're in the moment completely, and in the moment, therefore you're in eternity. You're in your own past and your own future. It's all connecting with you, but the intellect is out of this. And so some of those leftover emotions, um, which are like shadows, just drifting in the in the in the in the in the etheric kingdom, just like faint shadows shifting around, drifting, and one touches you, and you have this sense of sadness, and there's no way intellectually you could connect it with anything. Because we love to understand. That's our addiction. That's our addiction. And if you just allow more than try to understand, allow, um, generally from within there's an insight rises up and it's like a, just a light shines on it. Not something you necessarily understand, but a light shines on that shadow and that one's gone. And you didn't do anything. You didn't even know it's a shadow. You didn't even know you brought up a light. But in that just beingness, this sort of thing can happen because, in fact, we're miracle makers in denial. Right. I think this was a beautiful transition into practical ideas of how to deal with those things. So that's regarding <clears throat> this deeper sadness without a particularly understandable, rational reason in the <clears throat> moment. Um, well, one of the well, most co common things in that area is you're going to die right you've got a terminal illness and you're going to die or you've reached a terminal age and you're going to die for instance i look at my life and i realize there are many more years behind me in this body than they are in front of me now that doesn't concern me the slightest bit because i don't believe in death and transition i transitioned in why shouldn't I transition out? But for a lot of people, when they get my age and they're sitting in the old folks' homes, and oh my God, George died last week. Did you hear? George died. He was such a nice fellow. Sadness just increases grow. every day. And so gradually your fear is increasing and growing and you're having a stronger relationship with sadness because so many people look back on their life and reflect on what they didn't do they could have done what they did do and wish they hadn't done. And, uh, you know, when those people are sitting in those homes, all silent, staring into space, there's a lot of stuff going in on there, a lot of stuff going on inside them, and a lot of processing taking place. And they don't necessarily know how to deal with it. But uh, what I would say is, if you're in any position, then come back to the old um, <coughs> one of the principles of truth and that is where I focus my energy flows and connects and creates so move back toward focusing on, on that which has given you joy in life and that which has given you pleasure and those whom you loved and um, just focus on them and where you focus your energy flows and connecting with that is not trying to avoid something it's just saying sitting here sad doesn't work so i will selectively um choose what i focus on i think those and are the two yeah these are these are the two things that the only things that have well i think t three things help me one is nature just in general and then the other two is fo like, like what you just said focus on actually focus on what you're thankful for, what you're uh, inviting gratitude into your day for everything that is so beautiful. And then the, the other thing is focusing on the, the light and the love of the being that I really am. And then realizing that whatever that sadness is, is just moving through this old kind of cloud sun thing. I think that's very nicely said. I get it. And I think that's very nicely said. 
Um, but you're, on the other hand, you're on your spiritual path and you know that um, you're far more than you see in the mirror. For a lot of people, what they see in the mirror looks ruined by age and that's who they are. And they, and they, yesterday I was watching a video yesterday. I'm sure it was an entertainment one. And the girl said, she said, it's so stupid to believe there's life after death. She said, everyone knows that when you're dead, that's it. And, and I realized that, you know, this is a common belief that when you're dead, that's it. Um, yeah. Whether they like it or not. Now, when you're 25, that's okay. When you're 85, that's not so good to live with. It's um, when you're dead, that's the end. And then you begin to think, what's been the point? Now, there's part of the human sadness. You know, what's the point when you're elderly? What was the point of all this? What was the point? You know, if you ask the question seriously, then you might have to say, well, then maybe when this body dies, I continue this, this essential I, because otherwise, what is the point? It's a right. good question. Um, right. But generally speaking, the belief, and uh, <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned, the religion has created most of the sadness because they separated a person from their divinity. Like my spirituality is my direct relationship with the divine. And uh, I asked a person last night, do you not feel connected with the divine? And I never got an answer. I had a half an hour of him talking stuff, but there was never an answer. And then I realized, how could you feel a connection with the divine in yourself and be sad? There could be no sadness. There could be no fear. You could be no fear of death because you feel that connection. But religion took that away and put an intermediary called a priest there instead. And that basically, I'm not saying every religion, but the religions of which I'm aware, and certainly the Western ones, they, to me, have probably been one of the greatest causes of sadness um, in, the, in the Western humanity of anything else. Because paganism, which denied them, is so connected, so deeply connected. They walk out in nature yeah. Interestingly, and they feel though. connected. In, I mean, pro, if we haven't done already, we should do <laughs> we should do one on on religion probably. But the, a, another aspect, uh, quite controversial topic, but I think a, a, to me a very interesting and important aspect to this discussion would be if we say it's religion, it's externalizing it again, but ultimately it's the humans giving in, giving away their power um, and having embarked on a journey of, you know, I need someone to tell me what to do. Uh, I, I have to agree. I have to agree. Um, but then, you know, the journey we're on is not really or hasn't been human empowerment. It's been human control. And... Uh, I agree. In the end, it always comes down to us. And although we can point the finger out and religion is pointing the finger out, in the end, it always came down to what do I choose? I think you know, the, the, I was brought up religiously. I was born up. I think the, I the went kind to of, church. I rang the bells. I was confirmed. Now we're going. Now we're getting moving into a, another discussion. But just to fin, fin, maybe add two more words uh, to that. Um, I think the kind of trick here, the kind of interesting thing with, uh, and I, I can't speak for all religions, but at the way I perceive the religions that I know, the kind of interesting thing is that having been going into separation as humankind completely lost, but having this deeper awareness that we are more and that there is more and that there is a divine supreme creation, God, whatever, and then something external comes along and talks about that divinity in whatever distorted way, whatever it is. But so some part of you recognizes, oh, yes, there is something like that. So, but then you're not real. Like, so you, it's kind of like you're, then you're looking for it in that external representation, but then they're tricking you because it's all distorted by 
power and all of these things, right? But so they're making use of our inner feeling that there is truth to God, there is truth to all of these things. And we have this deep longing, right? Yeah, and we're easily fooled. We're very gullible. It's, it's kind of like and fooling very... a kid with a, a little bit of sweets. You know, it's like you get a kitten and you hold a ball of wool and you wave it around the kitten. We'll play with it. We do that. We play with it. and they, They're called distractions. Yeah. Um, but when you have forever, it's okay. Okay, we went a little bit off topic yeah. here. Did you want to close? Yeah. Have any closing remarks on sadness? Any closing remarks? Yeah, be happy. <laughs> no, live, live happy in New a Year. way that live in a way that allows you to find the joy within rather than the happiness without. I mean, and the, the way the way to that is through yourself um self uh, self love when there is self love that that sadness disappears that sadness it's not there it's like it's never been there it's like what sadness mm -hmm. and yet you know what it is and you know where it is and you know that you can feel it given the right circumstances but in your moment by moment life of loving self knowing that there's nothing outside of soul, it's a very fulfilling, empowering, and enlightening experience. Okay, by the way, did I tell you, with the color of your shirt and the tree and these branches growing out, you kind of look like the tree. And you've been going into jerky motions on this just the last um, five minutes, and I don't know whether you're seeing me that way, or whether it's your end, I don't know. you've been a bit, you've been jerky. It's okay. It hasn't made any difference to the sound. Isn't jerky a delicious thing? Okay. Uh, Anyhow, well, some, people, some people like it. it. It depends which animal it was jerked out of. <laughs> Have a great time, and if you enjoyed this conversations, as always, make sure to share them. Make sure to like them. Make sure to subscribe to this channel, and. And if you enjoy this conversation, then you would certainly enjoy when I go online talking about subjects in depth. You would certainly enjoy them because uh, it's just a lot more of this. And uh, but staying hopefully just a little bit more on track. We often wander off toward the end of this. And, uh, and that's okay because that opens the door for the next one. Au revoir. Au revoir. See you.